Welcome to the World War I Centennial News Podcast. It's about then, what was happening a hundred years ago in the aftermath of World War I, and it's about now, how a world transformed by World War I is very present in our lives today. But perhaps equally important, the podcast is about why and how we'll never let those events fall back into the mists of obscurity. So welcome to World War I Centennial News, episode number 107. This week on the show, we're going to start off exploring the headlines of the official bulletin, the Government War Gazette, and we're going to see what the U.S. government is talking about a hundred years ago this week. Dr. Edward Lengel joins us to talk about an American balloon company and their journey home from France. Then, in a new segment we're calling A Seat at the Table, exploring the participation at the Paris Peace Accords, this week, Yugoslavia. Mike Schuster dives into some of the details of the insurrections in Germany. We have part three of the story of Sergeant Roy Holtz, motorcycle courier. Saban Howard, the sculptor for the National World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C., is in the U.K., working on the sculpture with some amazing new high tech. We talked last week. And finally, we chat with Dr. Kathy Gorn, the executive director of National History Day, and how they're helping with World War I education. All this week on World War I Centennial News, which is brought to you by the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, and the Star Foundation. I'm Teo Mayer, the Chief Technologist for the Commission and your host. Welcome to the show. Welcome to In the News 100 Years Ago This Week. Now, before we get going, I want to tell you about a special publication called The Official Bulletin. Right after America declared war in 1917, President Wilson asked a gentleman named George Creel to set up and publish a daily newspaper in which the administration could inform America about its news, policies, programs, and initiatives for the war effort. In other words, it's the administration's daily propaganda gazette. As part of the centennial, we faithfully republished every issue, six issues a week, on the centennial of its original publication date. You'll find the whole collection at www.cc.org forward slash bulletin, all lowercase. It's a really amazing primary source of information for what the U.S. government was doing, thinking, proposing, promoting, and instructing during the war years. A lot of the Commission's web visitors have become avid daily readers. Well, we're just about out of issues to share with you. In fact, we thought we were going to run out next week. But one of our intrepid researchers, Dave Kramer, found another month's worth of issues, which we're going to get published at www.cc.org slash bulletin. And you can follow that in the link in the podcast notes. So let's jump into our centennial time machine and go back to the closing days of January 1919 and read some headlines from the official U.S. Bulletin. Dateline, Monday, January 27, 1919. Headline, President Wilson's speech to the Paris Conference for a League of Nations. Necessary, he says, to maintain peace. Continuous watch vital to protect all mankind from war and threats of war. Quote, must set up machinery to render conferences work complete. Describes ideal of American people speaking as their servant. Dateline, Tuesday, January 28th, 1919. Coming home from France. Headline, Disposition of Pet Animals Abandoned by Troop Units. It has been brought to the attention of the War Department that troop units, which had had dogs and other pet animals in their care as mascots, have abandoned them and are now outcasts and wanderers. 
Units should be instructed to make the proper disposition of such animals, and in accordance with the well-known sentiments of the Society for the Prevention of the Cruelty to Animals, prior to the demobilization of units and departures of its members for their homes. By order of the Secretary of War, Peyton C. March, General Chief of Staff. Clearing the way for a commercial aerospace industry. Headline. Restrictions upon private airplane exhibitions in U.S. withdrawn by presidential proclamation. Flying permits now granted. Permits for flying are now granted to qualified civilians who apply according to the requirements of the president's proclamation. In making an application for a flying license, the civilian is required to forward a copy of his or her certificate or license showing that the individual is qualified as a pilot. On Rebuilding and Expanding the U.S. Infrastructure Headline Nations Businessmen Asked to Make Suggestion Tending to Improve Postal Service And the story reads the Post Office Department has sent out a circular letter to more than 15,000 businessmen, firms, boards of trade, and chambers of commerce throughout the country, inviting suggestions and constructive criticisms which may tend to improve the Postal Service. Signed by J.C. Coons, First Assistant Postmaster General. And post-war America begins to consider a global market. Headline, American Shoes Are High in Favor Among Chinese People. American Shoes Are High in Favor Among the Chinese, says a report issued today by the Bureau of Foreign and Domestic Commerce, Department of Commerce. Most of the high-grade leather imported by the Chinese comes from the United States, and the government report states that this product can be sold in increasing quantities if proper representation is obtained, reasonable credit extended, and samples sent when special offerings are made. Japan offers a market for shoe-making machinery and materials rather than for shoes, as the use of imported footwear is very limited. It is estimated that about 7% of the population of Japan now uses modern footwear at least part of the time. Dateline, Wednesday, January 29, 1919. Headline, Executive Order Dissolving War Industries Board and Transferring Certain of Its Functions. The Executive Order by President Woodrow Wilson reads, Whereas, by Executive Order Number 2868, dated May 28, 1918, I established the War Industries Board, and now, by virtue of the armistice and approaching peace, it becomes desirable to provide for the dissolution of said board and for the termination of its activities in the manner herein set forth. But as controls are loosened with one hand, they're tightened with the other especially in regards to prohibition. Headline, Nationwide Prohibition Now in U.S. Constitution Declares Proclamation by Acting Secretary Polk. Acting Secretary of State Frank L. Polk today signed the proclamation certifying that the Prohibition Amendment has become valid as a part of the Constitution of the United States. The proclamation reads, Section 1. After one year from the date of ratification of this article, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors within, the importation thereof into, or the exportation thereof from the United States and all territories subject to the jurisdiction thereof for beverage purposes is hereby prohibited. In an incredibly relevant and prophetic article about America, maybe forgetting about World War I. Headline, History of War for Schools to be Issued by Government. In order that boys and girls in American schools may have the latest possible information on how the war was fought and won and what the problems of Reconstruction are, the Bureau of Education has just printed a special bulletin on America's part in winning World War Peace. The bulletin, which is illustrated throughout with cartoons and pictures of the day, 
will be distributed at cost by the government to all schools. Quote, it offers the needed help for schools which would study this most important phase of world history while its events are still fresh in the minds of the people and before interest in it has begun to wane, says Commissioner Claxton. Dateline, Thursday, January 30th, 1919. Headline, Polish Republic recognized by U.S. in cable to premier sent by Secretary Lansing by direction of the President. Promise given of America's help. The provisional Polish government is accorded complete recognition in a telegram which Secretary Lansing has sent Ignaz Pederowski by direction of President Wilson. And in commerce news, headline, exports of rubber tires from U.S. in year valued at over $15 million. Canada, Argentina, and Cuba were the principal countries of destination of the rubber tire exports from the United States during the fiscal year ended June 30th, 1918. Dateline, Friday, January 31st, 1919. In economic news. Headline, Home Loan Banks Are Planned Similar to Farm Loan Banks. And the story reads, More than half a million new dwelling houses now are needed in the United States. Two billion dollars available for loans to home builders would go far in providing the necessary capital for building these dwellings. In Science and Technology, Headline, Film Used Instead of Plates for Army X-Ray Photographs. And the story reads, from the office of the Surgeon General, the use of films instead of plates for taking the X-ray photographs, which have done so much to assist military surgery, has developed on a large scale during the war. And in international commerce. Headline, Italian import restrictions placed on leather and shoes. And the story reads, the War Trade Board announced that it has been requested by the High Commissioner for Italy to inform the American exporting public of the following restrictions which have been imposed upon the importation of leather and shoes into Italy. And that gives you some insight into what the U.S. government was publishing and talking about in its official bulletin 100 years ago this week. You'll find all the issues of the official bulletin at www.cc.org forward slash bulletin, all lowercase, or follow the link in the podcast notes. Next, we're joined by historian and author Dr. Edward Langle, who's a regular contributor to the podcast. His blog is called A Storyteller Hiking Through History. And this week, he brings us the story of an American balloon company's tempestuous voyage home from France. Private Austin Robert Johnson of Butte, Nebraska, served during World War I as a member of the U.S. Army's 12th Balloon Company. His outfit worked at the front during the Meuse Argonne campaign, providing vital observation for American infantry and artillery. It was dangerous duty, fraught with the possibility of a fiery death by accident or enemy action. But Private Johnson's worst memories were of being assigned to bury the shell-shattered bodies of American infantrymen. By March 1919, he and his comrades were looking forward to a pleasant sea voyage home to America and their families, but their adventures had not yet ended. The men of the 12th Balloon Company were stationed near Saint-Nazir, France, on the last day of February 1919, when they learned it was time to board a ship for home. You never seen such a giddy lot, Johnson remembered. We was singing, laughing, skipping. Waiting for them at the docks was the USS Princess Matoika, formerly the German liner Princess Alice. Matoika, the doughboys learned, was another name for Pocahontas and meant bright river between the hills, so long as it took them home in one piece. A week passed near dockside before the troops were allowed to board. Finally, on March 8th, the YMCA provided a treat of cigarettes, gum, candy, and hot chocolate, and the men filed on board. When full, the ship carried 3,300 men, tightly packed. Private Johnson felt lucky to get a top bunk along a wall below decks. He hit his head on the ceiling a number of times before he got used to it and had trouble sleeping in a life vest. 
At least I didn't have nobody seasick above puking down on me, like the voyage from America to France, he thought. Because the war was over, the troops could smoke cigarettes, walk down lighted passages, and open portholes, all forbidden luxuries several months before. They also got a nice supper of soup, pork roast, applesauce, and mashed potatoes with gravy before the Princess Matoika set sail. On the following day, as the ship left dock, the band played the Marseillaise, the Star Spangled Banner, and There's a Long, Long Trail, ensuring that the troops had tears in their eyes as they sang along and thought of home. Just a day out of port, the Princess Matoika ran into a brutal storm. It set the guy wires whistling and the flags overhead cracking like whips, Johnson remembered. The waves got rough as saw's teeth and started to swamp our starboard quarter. Smash, and the nose would jump high and drop. Ten seconds and another smash. On and on. The bow would leap up, arch, and the midship and stern follow. Oh man, was we sick. I got to say the fish ate pretty good right then, he recalled. The sea calmed after a couple of days, and the men were able to eat and relax again. Dozens of severely wounded men were brought out on deck to take the fresh air, closely tended by nurses. Private Johnson marveled at their terrible injuries, some missing arms and legs and others facially disfigured. More stayed below deck, sick with the flu and other illnesses, and several died during the voyage. The food was never as good again as it had been that first evening. Beans and rice made up much of the soldier's diet. Learning that he could get a little more food if he volunteered for ship duty, Private Johnson signed up and almost immediately regretted it. One of his assignments was stoking boilers in the stifling hot engine room. Another was cleaning the bilge down by the propeller shaft, where there was a constant wash of filthy seawater. Still, I liked to watch the shaft spin, Johnson recalled. And it was amazing to lean my head against the hull of the ship down there and listen to the water racing by with a mighty rush roaring along only three feet from my ear. Back topside, Private Johnson and other doughboys enjoyed boxing matches, exercising, playing games, or just smoking and talking. But sleep remained difficult. During one spell on deck, Private Johnson encountered a group of shell-shocked doughboys under the care of their nurses. Witnessing their trauma brought back to him his terrible memories of burying body parts at the front and inspired a spate of nightmares. At night, Johnson's bunkmate often had to prod him awake with a broom handle to stop his screaming. With feelings such as these, work could ironically be a relief. Just a couple days out of her destination at Newport News, Virginia, the Princess Matoika hit another storm and the bilge pump broke down. The hole sprung a leak until the bilges were flooded with six feet of water and the ship listed to port. Eventually, the ship went dead in the water and the captain ordered emergency repairs to the pump. Fortunately for all on board, the repairs were successful, and the Princess Matoika was again underway. I felt like we was being pulled home by a magnet, Johnson remembered. The sparkling lighthouses of the Virginia Capes came in view in the early morning hours of March 20th, 1919. When the harbor pilot came on board just before dawn, the troops gave him a rousing cheer. Pretty soon, the east started pinking up, Johnson remembered, and we seen in the distance the shoreline and buildings of Newport News. Some thrilled to see our homeland once more, and at last, after so much misery and tribulation. Just before the ship docked, Private Johnson pulled out his New Testament and prayed thanks to God for the safe journey. A crowd awaited the doughboys as they marched into town, and the American Red Cross provided treats, including slices of good old American pie. As horns and whistles honked and tooted from nearby factories, a woman walked up behind Private Johnson. Turn around, soldier, she said, and, as Johnson recalled, throwed her arms around me and give me a big kiss like to lifted me right up out of my socks. It was good to be home. Dr. Edward Lengel, historian, World War I expert, author, and storyteller hiking through history. We have links for you to Ed's posts and his author's website in the podcast notes. The gathering at Versailles has the potential of defining an entirely new world order, rising out of the ashes of the most devastating war in human history. Who's there and who isn't is a key issue for the people and nations in this defining moment. So with that in mind, today we're launching a new segment for the podcast called A Seat at the Table. 
We're starting this week with some emerging nations from the same region where this devastating war broke out in the first place. This week, Yugoslavia and their seat at the table. A delegation of almost 100 Serbs, Croats, Slovenes, Bosnians, and Montenegrins took their seat at the Paris Peace Conference in January of 1919, representing a new nation. They'd gathered together into something they called Yugoslavia. While many people assume that it was at the conference that they created Yugoslavia, historian Margaret Macmillan points out in her comprehensive history of the Versailles Peace Treaty that the nation was actually created in December of 1918. A couple of guys, one a Serb and the other a Croat, who had been on opposing sides during the war, were the co-leaders of the delegation. Now, clearly, it wasn't going to be easy to hammer out a new order. Well, if you think about it, in a world suddenly unshackled from the restraints of imperial control, overlords, what defines a nation? Well, the most frequent answer is a common language. But how strong of a bond is that in the face of differing religions, old grudges, unsettled historical issues, and all that stuff? It's really kind of a mess. By February, the coalition decides that they wanted additional lands from Hungary on the east, ports on the Adriatic to the west, and other lands to the south. Now, it's all very well and good, but there were others who had claims to the same lands. As Macmillan points out, even the brief possession of a piece of land centuries ago could be hauled out to justify a current claim. Now, some claims dated back to 14th century kingdoms, even the 10th century, and even back to classical times. The Italian claim to the Adriatic ports were pretty recent, and after all, Italy had one of the big boy seats at the table. The United States generally supported the Yugoslavs, and so did the French. They figured a strong Yugoslavia would hold back Germany in the south. And meanwhile, the Brits didn't really care how the Balkans sorted themselves out. In the end, their seat at the table got Yugoslavia a new nation with Serbia at its heart, and it was three times larger than before with the addition of Montenegro, Slovenia and Bosnia from Austria, Croatia, part of Banat from Hungary, and parts of Albania and Bulgaria. It was a good beginning for a new nation, but it never really totally gelled. And sadly, Yugoslavia fell apart less than a century later in 2002. Next, we're joined by Mike Schuster, former NPR correspondent and curator for the Great War Project blog. Mike, in last week's show, we presented a bunch of headlines about the Spartacist revolt in 1919 Germany. Now, your post this week provides a lot of detail. Seems like the Bolsheviks and Lenin were trying to step into a power vacuum in Germany. Without a doubt, they were, Teo. Here's the headline. Revolution in Germany. Communists moved to take power. Hundreds shot down in the streets by own army. Street fighting turns ferocious. And this is special to the Great War Project. While President Wilson is feasting on worshipful applause in Italy in the early days of January a century ago, Germany is confronting a Bolshevik onslaught. Reports historian Thomas Fleming, soldiers and people's councils have taken over many cities. Berlin remains unconquered, but it's teetering on the brink. Demonstrations, strikes, and armed mobs were everywhere. Behind most of the demonstrations was the Spartacus Union, a radical group that found inspiration in the story of the gladiator Spartacus, leader of a revolt against Rome in 73 BC. Fleming writes, the Spartacists were led by Karl Liebknecht, son of a founder of the German Socialist Party, and by Rosa Luxemburg, a brilliant Polish activist. Behind them was the Bolshevik leader, Vladimir Lenin, who shipped them gold from Russia's treasury and ordered them to turn Germany into a Soviet satellite. Under this pressure, it becomes clear that control of Berlin is slipping away from Germany's more moderate leaders, led by the new German Chancellor Friedrich Ebert. Ebert panics and moves to place the German army under his control. He is not successful. Public disorder only increased, and emboldened Liebknecht decides that the capital is ready for revolution. Luxembourg disagrees. On the night of January 5th, a century ago, thousands of armed leftists poured down Berlin's broad streets. They swiftly captured major buildings in the center of Berlin, 
and prepared to take over the capital. By this time, reports the story in Fleming, the Spartacists had changed their name to the Communist Party, leaving no doubt about their goals. Reports Fleming, Ebert called on the army for help into action when thousands of demobilized veterans recruited into new units called Free Corps. The Free Corps are told the place of the imperial government has been taken by that of Chancellor Ebert. He needs strength for the struggle on our borders and the struggle within. Plunder and disorder are everywhere. Nowhere is there respect for law and justice. We must intervene. On January 10th, an all-out battle erupts in the center of Berlin. The army uses flamethrowers, machine guns, hand grenades, mortars, and artillery to smash the communists out of major buildings and improvised street forts. An estimated 1,000 bystanders and pedestrians are killed in the ferocious fighting, which leaves several buildings gutted. Hundreds of Spartacists were executed on the spot, even though they tried to surrender under white flags. Continues historian Fleming, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht were hunted down and dragged to a nearby hotel for a brief interrogation. Then they were ordered to prison. En route to prison, their heads were smashed by rifle butts. Pistols added the coup de grace. Luxembourg's body was thrown into a canal where it remained until May. The public was informed that the two revolutionaries were shot while trying to escape. And that's the news these days a century ago from the Great War Project. Mike Schuster is the curator for the Great War Project blog. The link to his post is in the podcast notes. Next, we're going to part three of our multi-part story about Sergeant Roy Holtz of Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, the first soldier on German soil after the armistice of World War I. And he did it riding on a Harley Davidson. Our good friend, citizen historian and author Rob Laplander, wrote a researched account of the story, what actually happened, intended for high school students. Well, Rob gave us permission to read the story to you in serial form. Here is the unabridged First into Germany, Sergeant Roy Holtz, and he did it on a Harley, by author Robert Laplander. Part 3. Rolling with the Red Arrow. Chapter 7, My Brother's Keeper. A lot of Wisconsin and Michigan men were formed into the 32nd Division in August of 1917. They became known as the Red Arrow Division, but we'll get to that. By February, they were in France and headed for their training area at the front. Between May of 1918 and the end of the war, the division would only know 10 days when it wasn't actually under enemy fire. They would capture thousands of prisoners, defeat 11 German divisions, and never yield a foot of ground that they'd taken. They also earned the French nickname of Les Terribles, the Terrible Ones, for their fierceness in action. Now, it was in one of the very first battles that Corporal Roy Holtz saved his brother Ezra's life. In the hours after the battle, Ezra lay in the mud of the battlefield, wounded and poisoned by mustard gas. Ezra was sure that he was going to die before any medics could find him, as he didn't have enough breath to yell out to them because of the gas that he'd inhaled. Then, lying there, he heard the distinctive, familiar put 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 of a slow-moving motorcycle. Now, Ezra knew that Roy drove a motorcycle with the 107th Field Signal Battalion, and he also knew that he'd been working in the same area during the battle. Could this actually be his brother? When they were boys, back in Chippewa Falls, the brothers had developed a particular-sounding loud whistle. They used it to keep contact with each other out in the woods so they wouldn't get lost. Now, while Ezra didn't have enough breath to yell out loud, he did have enough breath to whistle, which he did. Suddenly, the putt-putt-putt-putt of the motorcycle stopped, and Ezra whistled again. Only minutes later, there was Roy, plodding over to him with his goggles pushed up on the furry part of his aviator cap above the dirt-smeared face. And before long, Ezra was in a hospital recovering from his wounds, and Roy was back out on the muddy roads of France, speeding across the battlefield with more important messages. 
after he got out of the hospital, Ezra transferred to the 107th Field Signal Battalion as well and became one of the motorcycle mechanics. Chapter 8, Into the Argonne. The 32nd Division gained real fame during the massive Meuse-Argonne Offensive. Planned by General Pershing to be the war-winning blow against Germany, the Meuse-Argonne Offensive would be the biggest and bloodiest battle in American history, ever, even until today. The battle stretched for 14 miles from the east bank of the Meuse River to the western edge of the Great Argonne Forest. The final objective was cutting off the main German rail lines north of the battlefront, which supplied all the German armies in northern France and in Belgium. However, between the main American jump-off lines and those German rail lines, there were three German defensive lines to be broken through with a depth of 12 miles. All of the area was heavily fortified by the German army, and it was known as the Hindenburg Line to try to smash through as quickly as possible. Nine divisions of the American army went over the top on the foggy morning of September 26, 1918, following a huge artillery bombardment or barrage designed to soften up the enemy. Well, the barrage only worked some, and the attacking doughboys, some 600,000 men, ran into serious resistance. In the end, the battle would last a total of 47 bloody days. In fact, running right up to the last day of the war on November 11th, 1918. 27,000 American troops would lose their lives in combat. Over 1.2 million doughboys from 22 American divisions would see action in the Meuse-Argonne. The 32nd wasn't in the initial jump-off. Instead, they were held in reserve and wouldn't reach the front until they were brought in to relieve the 37th Division that had taken a lot of casualties. It was during the fighting over the next 20 days that the 32nd Division earned their nickname and distinctive unit insignia, a red arrow piercing a solid line, as they were the first division to break through one of the strongest German lines on the morning of October 14, 1918. Corporal Roy Holtz and his Harley Davidson were at the head of the attack all the way, running messages at speed and performing important reconnaissance missions, sometimes alone and other times with a passenger in the sidecar. The war was winding up towards a dramatic climax as they approached the Meuse River. The Meuse was the last large water barrier to cross, after which mostly open country led to the German border, and the U.S. Army was beginning to plan for the next move, driving the attack onto German soil. But getting across this heavily defended river was going to prove to be quite a chore. That was part three of First into Germany, Sergeant Roy Holtz, and he did it on a Harley, by author Robert Laplander. Rob Laplander is a citizen historian, author of the book Finding the Lost Battalion, and importantly, the man behind the Doughboy MIA project. We have links for you in the podcast notes about this story, Harley, and the Doughboy MIA site. Join us again next week for part four, as Roy Holtz reveals that he speaks German, and we hear the actual story behind the iconic picture of him on his Harley. All right, let's fast forward into the present with World War I Centennial News Now. As our regular listeners know, this part of the podcast focuses on the present and explores World War I documentation, commemoration, education, and exploration. Here is where we try to show you how the echoes of the war that changed the world are very present in our everyday lives. For this week's segment of A Hundred Years in the Making, the insider story about the creation of the National World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C., I had a chance to chat with the memorial sculptor Sabin Howard as he was getting ready to jump on a plane for the U.K. to launch the next steps in scaling up his one six size maquette as he heads for one of the only foundries in the world that will be able to cast the full-size sculpture. Since developing the maquette, you've been through some other steps in the development. Could you outline those? 
Yeah, I developed the maquette in New Zealand last year, and it was February. The maquette got mailed to the Commission of Fine Arts, and we went to a meeting, and we did not pass. And so then we continued to make presentations to incorporate the sculpture so it would fit better into the park. And from that, we finally reached an agreement in July with the Commission of Fine Arts that we needed to now make a second maquette that would fit onto a pedestal. My client, the Centennial Commission, had some ideas about historical correctness in the uniforms and very, very few edits. That now we are going to go back with the same composition, but just I need to do some historical modifications that are minor. There's another big thing that happened that you guys started doing a search for who could possibly cast this thing. How'd that go? That was a process, an epic unto itself, because I spent four months traveling the United States, looking at foundries, looking at enlargement systems, looking at tech companies, because the issue that we have at hand is this is a really large project with an incredibly small space of time to produce it. And so technology comes into solving that problem. And most of the foundries that I found in the United States were smaller by nature, like, you know, maybe 20 employees. And the last month that I was doing my search for where do we get this done and what's the best process to use, I was looking on Instagram and I came upon a friend's sculpture of a bear that is in Rhode Island. And Nick Bibby, he's a British sculptor. I looked at this bear that he had done and I looked at the foundry and I was like, that's where I need to go look. So this is a 200-employee foundry. It's one of the largest ones in Europe, and it makes it even funnier. Damien Hurst is one of their major clients who's invested a tremendous amount of money into their casting his own sculptures, which he did this big show in Venice at the Dogana. It was the wreck of the unbelievable. That was like these massive pieces that he cast there, and many, many of them too. And then he also did a 65-foot high resin sculpture that was installed into a palazzo in Venice inside the building. And so there were all these other technical issues of engineering and weight and transportation that require an infrastructure and a company that has really strong logistics and brilliant technicians. And I'm like, all right, Eureka. I saw some pictures of this new photogrammetry rig that they've put together, which is basically for our listening audiences, a giant 3D scanner, if you want to think of it that way. And they just finished a brand new one that's quite unique. Yeah. Photogrammetry is you have an object or a model in the middle, and then around it are you have these almost Christmas tree rigs that might have 10 cameras from ground to 12 feet up in the air. So then you might have a dozen of these that are all mounted around and pointed towards the central space where the model's going to be. They all go off at the same time, the cameras, and then they continue to move, taking shots, thousands of shots. All this information then gets fed into a computer, and the computer assembles the data and makes a object, which is the model. The model then is in the computer. It's almost a scan of what's there in reality. It's a life cast, let's call it. The life cast then can be milled out, passing the information to a CNC machine that routers it out of whatever material you need. And so that's my very accurate armature that lies underneath the surface of where I apply the clay. And so Pangolin, in conjunction with this photography studio that's right there on site, Steve Russell Photography, decided, you know, after they had come over and met with Daniel Dayton in the commission, it was like, yes, this is a very good fit. And they went back and they amped up their system. So this is now the best photogrammetry system in the whole world because now we're up to, I believe, 160 cameras, all incredibly high level. And there's no other system in the world that can capture this much detail with this much resolution and this much depth. Well, so you're heading over to the UK coming up shortly. What's the purpose of this first trip over? I head over on Saturday. And I'm bringing over five models from my initial drawings and photography that I did with the cell phones here in New York City. And what we're going to do is we will pose them in the exact same positions that we had in the relief because the next steps will be that that milling out of the foam will then get shipped back to my New York studio probably by summer. And then those models then will be posing for me live as I continue to work traditionally. 
Now, this is all to scale it up from 10 inches tall to full size, right? Yeah, that's right. The maquette gets amplified six times, and so you're looking at a height of around seven foot six. There might be some corrections for scale, so maybe eight feet max. From there, the styrofoam that is milled out has to be assembled with a steel armature so you can take it apart, not only for being able to sculpt behind the figures and parts, but also for the next process down the road, which will be the molding of all these parts. And the little model had 120 molds made of it. This one will probably have 120 molds as well. Well, a fascinating process. Saban, how are you feeling about the whole thing? I know that this is a pretty monumental project. All pun intended. I'm very excited on one side. And on the other side, I also have a little bit of a pang of regret because we're not sculpting this traditionally because of the time frame. It's very exciting in some way because it's kind of like a new step in my own life because here I would spend maybe two years on a sculpture, a single figure. And I might work with a life model for 3,500 hours on one single piece. But now it's like I have 38 figures to cover and a lot of people saying, we want this right now. I look back at the Renaissance and I'm like, wow, that is really a thing of the past at this point because of how technology has stepped in to replace almost like half of the grunt work in the middle. What you're saying are the same words that you will hear from people who moved away from cutting negative and film where the time that it took and what you lose is the reflection time, the think space. Yes, that's a good way of putting it. It's like the think space is gone, the time spent in process is gone, but maybe now I'll be making like four or five of these before I end. Who knows? For our segment on World War I education this week, we're joined by Dr. Kathy Gorn, the Executive Director of National History Day and an adjunct professor of history at the University of Maryland at College Park. Kathy, for our listeners, would you give us a quick background on National History Day? Sure. National History Day is an academic program for students in 6th through 12th grades, that's middle and high school. And the program invites students to choose a topic in history, and it can be anything, as long as the student is interested in it. And then it asks to go out and conduct real research, like historians would, conducting research into primary as well as secondary information and drawing conclusions about why a particular topic is important, what was its significance in history, why should we be aware of it. Students can enter a competition by creating a project, and that can be a paper, or they can do a tabletop exhibit. They can do a 10-minute documentary or a 10-minute dramatic performance or a website. So it gives them a creative outlet as well as the intellectual part of the program. And the winners move on to the first History Day contest, which would be sort of a regional, maybe a couple of counties in your area. And then winners go on to a state. And then winners come to our big finals in College Park in June each year. So it's a very rigorous program. It takes a lot on the part of students and teachers. Teachers guide the kids in this work. And it's really several months of work for them. But the payoff is really incredible. Well, the program has a stellar reputation for not only what it inspires, but really what the students do. Let me ask you something. Last year, National History Day became part of the World War I Education Consortium. How did that happen? What does it mean? And what have you been doing since then? We actually started doing some things even before that for World War I. We developed a teacher source book, so it had lesson plans and essays and things. And then we heard from Libby O'Connell, who is one of the commissioners, and Libby and I go way back. She told me what was going on with the commission and asked if we might have some ideas. And we came up with several. And I think the commission really liked what we suggested and gave us the go ahead. So we just completed our webinar series. And that was conducted by professional historians and particular topics related to World War I. And then also the last 15 minutes of each of these one-hour webinars then was, how do you translate this now into a middle school or high school classroom? 
So it was a really nice blend of intellectual information and teaching ideas. I've seen a map of where the participants were, and you covered the nation very well. Absolutely. And not only the nation, but we're in programs internationally. We're really growing in different areas around the world. So we're really excited about that aspect. We're reaching a lot more teachers and kids that way. Well, you have another program that you're doing where you invited teachers to submit applications for something that you're calling Memorializing the Fallen. Tell me about that program a little bit, because I have an interview with one of the teachers that's one of the actual participants that we're going to be running as well. Well, that program is designed to not only engage teachers in a really in-depth study of World War I, but to turn these teachers into teacher ambassadors so that they can also conduct teacher workshops for us in their areas. We had 334 applications for just 18 slots. So it tells you how popular this is and how actually kind of needy teachers are to learn more about World War One, so they can teach it more effectively. So in addition to all the reading and everything else, they have to choose what we call a silent hero, someone who went to war but didn't come home. And that's designed to make history personal. So in studying a silent hero from their own backyard, their own community, hopefully, or at least their own state, This makes it personal. And so in the process of all this, teachers also create a website to honor that individual. And it goes up on our website, silentheroes.org. We're really creating an opportunity here for teachers to learn more so that they can then more effectively teach the history of World War I to their students and also honor a silent hero who gave that ultimate sacrifice for their country. Now, this all culminates in a big event in June. What's that? It does indeed. So after we've done all this reading and research, we go to Europe. So we'll start the program in Belgium, in Flanders American Cemetery, and then we go into France and we'll go to Wazen Cemetery and Muzargan, etc. And while we're there in the cemeteries, we will go to the graves of the silent heroes that were studied, and the teacher present eulogies that they've written for their silent hero. And it is profound. Not only does this make it more personal, but it has an impact unlike really anything I've seen before. This is modeled after a program we did in Normandy, and it's life-changing for everyone involved. The power of place is extremely important an opportunity to actually stand where history took place is a very powerful thing. It brings it home in a huge way. Katha, let me go into one more direction. And this really falls out of the conversation that I had with one of the selected teachers, Michael Sandstrom. We started talking about history education at large in the United States. It's kind of in trouble, isn't it? It is indeed. We've had all this emphasis on science, technology, engineering, and math, the STEM subjects. And those subject areas are very, very important. Problem is, it's come at the expense of the humanities. Schools have reduced the time and the attention placed on history and the humanities. And that's a serious, serious problem. History helps young people find their heroes, find their role models. It also helps them understand cause and effect, change over time, that there are consequences to actions. It helps them understand today better. And when they become voters, they'll understand how to place current issues into historical perspective to really get a grasp on meaning and make better decisions for the future. So ultimately, history education is about creating good citizens for the future of democracy. So we've got a crisis right now because we are not teaching this enough to young people so that they really can come out with really thoughtful notion about what it means to be a citizen of a democracy. Okay, so thank you for National History Day and the work that you all are doing. It's really important and you're keeping the flame alive. That's our mission. And I think those of us who work for and with National History Day do understand it as a cause It's not really a job, it's a cause. Kathy Gorn is the Executive Director of National History Day. Learn more about the organization and its programs by the link in the podcast notes. 
Welcome to our feature, Speaking World War I, where we explore the words and phrases that are rooted in the war. Now, this week we're going to reprise a term that we first brought up in episode number 71 back in May of 2018. Waking up to a steaming cup of coffee is a universal pleasure. It's warm, it's fortifying, it can help you make it into and through your day. That warm drink is sometimes referred to as a cup of joe. In fact, this nickname for coffee has a rather murky origin, with several theories being put forward. And one of the more common legends is that the Joe in the phrase refers to Josephus Daniels, the American Secretary of the Navy during World War I. Daniels was an ardent prohibitionist, and as such, he banned consumption of alcohol aboard Navy ships well before Prohibition and even before America declared war. It was General Order 99, issued on June 1, 1914, that ended the shipboard toddy of rum for the sailors. So, our swabbies were forced to indulge in other beverages, particularly coffee, which led the men to refer to a serving of coffee as a cup of joe. Now, there's some doubt about the truth of this myth, since alcohol was already hard to come by aboard vessels for ordinary sailors. General Order 99 had little impact on their lives. It's possible that the name Joe denotes an ordinary, everyday guy, reflecting the rise of coffee consumption at the turn of the 20th century. But (laughs) I like the Daniels myth. A cup of Joe. This week's phrase for Speaking World War I. There are links for you in the podcast notes. For Spotlight on the Media. In December, we introduced you to and invited you to see the musical stage production based on the story of the Hello Girls. There may be men here who are ready to doubt We got the guts to cut the mustard As soon as we're in gear They're gonna find out that when everything goes through And they're saying no through We'll save the day and find a way of getting the calls through Well, the show run was a great success, and now they're in the middle of producing a cast album, which is very cool. To do this, they've set up a crowdfunding site to help pay for the production at www.thehellogirlsmusical.com. Now, you can go there to help this wonderful project and to get some perks like pre-release digital copies, invitations to the release party, and you can even buy into being an associate producer for the album. Check out our episode number 100 from December 7th, 2018, where we interview the producers of this stimulating show about the first women who joined the U.S. Army, went and served bravely in France, but faced their biggest fight when they got home to be recognized as veterans and claim their benefits. Follow the link in the podcast notes to learn more. And that wraps up episode number 107 of the award-winning World War I Centennial News Podcast. Thank you for listening. We also want to thank our guests, Dr. Edward Lengel, military historian and author, Mike Schuster, curator for the Great War Project blog, Rob Laplander for graciously allowing us to serialize his short story about Roy Holtz, Dr. Kathy Gorn, executive director of National History Day, Saban Howard for telling us about his upcoming trip to the U.K., Special thanks to Mac Nelson and Tim Crow, our interview editing team, Katz Laszlo, the line producer for the show, J.L. Michaud and Dave Kramer for research and writing, and I'm Teo Mayer, your producer and host. The U.S. World War I Centennial Commission was created by Congress to honor, commemorate, and educate about World War I. Our programs are to inspire a national conversation and awareness about World War I, including this podcast. We're bringing the lessons of 100 years ago to today's educators, their classrooms, and the public. We're helping to restore World War I memorials in communities of all sizes across the country. And of course, we're building America's national World War I memorial in Washington, D.C. We want to thank the Commission's founding sponsor, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, as well as the Star Foundation for their support. The podcast and a full transcript of the show can be found on our website at www.cc.org/cn. 
You'll find World War I Centennial News in all the places you get your podcasts, and even using your smart speaker by saying, play WW1 Centennial News Podcast. The podcast Twitter handle is at the WW1 Podcast. The Commission's Twitter and Instagram handles are both at WW1CC, and we're on Facebook at WW1 Centennial. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget, keep the story alive for America by helping us build the memorial. Just text the letters WWI or WW1 to the phone number 9999. Thank you for listening. So long.